Can you say amen for that? Yeah. yeah, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows, what? Yeah. Whatever my lot, who taught me to say it? He did. That's the wellness center up there. Would you agree? That's the wellness center. Come boldly to the throne of grace and you get what? Matthew 9, 22. I'm going to pray in one moment. Matthew 9, 22. Thy faith has made thee whole. Now, the place to find faith is where? <laughs> up there. Yeah, come boldly to the throne of grace that you might receive what? What are you going to be, Hebrews 4, 14, 15, what are you going to be receiving? Mercy and grace for your time of what? Need. I have a need tonight, don't you? I need to go respectfully, boldly, but respectfully to the throne of grace, don't we? Don't we? Okay, well... <laughs> Now, before I start, let me say something. I've never seen a reaction in a congregation like I saw yesterday when I said Cal Thrash used to be sour before God made him sweet. I have never seen a reaction like they were ready to rise up and run me out of here. You must be a nice guy. <laughs> Is he or not? <laughs> the people love you, Cal. Uh, I like that. No, I'll keep that. Yeah. All right, I'll pray. But he was sour before God made him sweet, right? <laughs> Oh, there they go again. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, Father in heaven, this, uh, this evening as we study, we're glad we can find some sweetness in Christ. So I pray this will be a wellness center tonight. Healing will come from the great physician. Please pay us a visit. I ask it from my heart in Jesus' name. Amen. Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, I'm going to ask questions. You give answers. The answers are in Hebrews 12, 22. Is there a church up in heaven? Yeah, oh, there is. Next question, Hebrews 12, 22. I'll ask questions, answers in 12, 22 and 12, 23. Hebrews 12, 22. You've come unto Mount Zion, the city of the who? L living God, comma, the what kind of Jerusalem? Heavenly Jerusalem. Now, next part, who's in the church up there? Who goes to church up there? Now, how many angels? And innumerable company of angels. Now, I don't know if that really means what it says, but that's not symbolic, the book of Hebrews, right? <laughs> that says literal. There are very few parts of the Bible, Daniel 7, some parts of Ezekiel, Revelation, some parts are symbolic. Most of the Bible means just what it says. You would agree, wouldn't you? Yes. And if you see something symbolic, like the beast in Daniel, Daniel 7, 17, these four beasts are four kings. You've got to have the Bible interpret the symbol. Is there really a church? Yes. Do the angels go to church? Yes, I wonder who preaches there. There's a tip-off in verse 23. What's the name of the church? It's not the General Conference of Seventy Adventists. It's the what? The Church of the Firstborn. He left off a word. Hebrews 12, 23. The gen, 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 I'll give you a hint, gen, General Assembly in the Church of the Firstborn. Who's the firstborn? Matthew 1, 25, her firstborn son. They named the church after, evidently they named it after Jesus. Do you think he preaches up there? I don't know. But I know one day, where is that church? It's in the heavenly Jerusalem. I, John, saw the holy city coming down 
I, saw, I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven as bright adorned for her husband. Will the church come down one day? Yes. Will we be able to go to church? I hope. First up there, and then down here. But if you want to go to church there, you've got to think like they think up there. You've got to think like they think in heavenly Jerusalem, not earthly Jerusalem. Because Jesus came into the earthly Jerusalem, and instead of crowning him, they crucified him. So I'd like to study, contrast two things. And then I got a picture of, is there a doctor in the house? There's one. <laughs> I'm going to talk about surgery. Dr. Mark, you feel free to, to correct me if what I say is wrong. Or any other doctor in the house. Or these, all these health educators and medical missionary types. All these people that know what an antigen is, right? And organ transplants. So now we begin. I'm going to need some help when I get to Jeremiah 10. So if some helpful soul would put a finger in Jeremiah 10 and one on Isaiah 2, I'll be very thankful when I get there. First of all, up in heaven, they found that man had sinned. Because the world from the beginning has always been a 1 Corinthians 4, 9, a spectacle to the world. And who? Angels. And men. keep angels. I'm going, to, I'm going to highlight angels. To the world, to the angels, and to men so man fell what's the first thing they did up in heaven what's the first recorded step and uh, let me change that what did they do up in heaven there's the church who's in the church well i don't know because the uh would you agree the the godhead they moved together right genesis 1 verse 1 in the beginning god what created what the heaven here now john uh, genesis 1 verse 1 john 1 verse 1 the beginning was same thing but the word and the word was with god and the word was god john 1 verse 3 all things were made by him and without him was nothing was not anything made that was made who made everything who was the agent of creation it was the father there where's the holy ghost verse 2 right the holy ghost they're all there isn't that great they're all there they're all there what was the big occasion uh, not day one, day two. Those were, those were nice occasions. <laughs> those were good occasions, but the, 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 the very good occasion was day which? Which day? What did he make that day? Man. Were they interested in this new and distinct creation called man made in the image of God? Yes. So when man fell, there's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, and the angels, the innumerable company of angels, the first move. Romans 8, 32, He that spared not his own son, for God so loved the world, John 3, 16, He what? He gave. God the Father sent God the Son. That's how they think up in Jerusalem. Did Jesus, now pause, Galatians 4, 26, the Jerusalem above is, Galatians 4, 26, the Jerusalem above is free, comma, and the mother of us all. That means there's no, uh, there's no compulsion, there's no force, it's all free will. When Jesus went, He went by His choice. God sent Him, but He willingly went. Step one. Step number two, 2 Corinthians 5.19. To wit, God was in Christ, comma, reconciling the world unto Himself. Number two, there goes the Son. Who's next? The Father. I'm not trying to confine God to the earth, because God's big and I, 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 God's too big. But I am confining the focus of the Father and Son to this earth. God the Son, God the Father, who's next? Yeah, by the way, John 14, 26, John 15, 26, saying the same thing. I will send you the who? Now, is God the Father going to send it the name of Jesus? Yeah, the Comforter's next. Here's the Father, there's the Son, there's the Holy Ghost. Is heaven a ghost town? No, there's an innumerable what? company of angels who goes next because when jesus fights he always goes first right revelation 12 7 and who michael and his angels the lord always goes first aren't you glad no aren't you glad you're going to fight with him he says stand behind me <laughs> yeah he said, come on this is biblical this is yeah biblical the bible's a book that changes so what about the angels what about the angels Hebrews 1, verse 14. Are not they all ministering spirits? What? Next word? Sent. Sent where? 
To minister to who? Those that would be the heirs of salvation. Are you Hebrews 1.14? The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, the angels, they're all, their focus is where? Here. It's not there. They left there to come here. And we could take a hundred more verses to prove it. But that's very clear. Would you agree? This is how they think up there. Well, God the Father to the Son, they fell. Jesus said, now let's, the plan was how old? And how old is, I don't know. I don't know. It was, it was, uh, it was the plan was there. And Jesus said, the time, Galatians 4, verse 4, in the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son. The clock rang, boom! And Jesus said, I'm off and running. Running where? To the cross. And then the Father, well, there goes my Son. To wit, God was in Christ. He's coming down to do some reconciling Himself. Then the Holy Ghost probably felt lonely. <laughs> so He sent Him too. And I realized, Genesis 1 verse 2, they're all there, I know. I'm just trying to make a point. This is how the mind works up there. In Philippians 2, 5, let this mind be, you've got to have that kind of mind down here. That's the kind of mind they have. Father, Son, Holy Ghost, and the angels. Now, Jerusalem down here. When, you, when I started reading the Bible, I noticed there, uh, there seemed to be three kind of groups of people. <laughs> the Jews, number two, who? The Gentiles. And then there was like this, uh, you know, when, uh, when Solomon turned away and Rehoboam took the throne. And Rehoboam said, well, you know, dad was easy going. <laughs> you haven't seen nothing yet. How many tribes walked away? Ten. Now, they called it the Northern Kingdom or Samaria. The kingdom of Samaria intermixed with the Assyrians and those ten tribes became some half-breed country intermixed with the, with the Syrians and were known as the who? Samaritans. Jew, Gentile, Samaritans. We start with the Samaritans, then the Gentiles, then the Jews, and then us. I always, we always ought to end with us. So the uh, Samaritans. Who's there? Before you open the door, you ought to know, shouldn't you? Shouldn't you? Don't know who's there. Uh, John chapter 4. Who, who's the woman? The woman at the well. What is she? She's a Samaritan. And so Jesus offers her the living water. And if you read about it, you know, they start this uh, conversation. The Lord trying to win her soul, offers her living water. And then, uh, you know, she, she's, she has an interest. And he says, go get your husband. She says, I have no husband. Al speaketh well. You got five husbands and a man you're with now. He's your six. He's not your husband either. Then she turns the subject to what? Religion. Isn't that crazy? She turned the subject to religion. <laughs> well, our fathers worshiped and this, that, and the other. Now, John 4, verse 22. What did Jesus say to her? Woman, ye worship. You know not what. You got no clue who you worship. Okay? You don't know who you worship. Acts 17, 23. Paul going into Mars Hill on the Oropagus. These are the Jews or the Gentiles? Gentiles. It's Athens, the Oropagus, Mars Hill. There's Paul. As Paul walks into the Mars Hill, Acts 17, verse 23, the first part of the verse, does it use the word devotion? The last part of the word verse, does it use the word worship service? The middle part of the verse tells you who they worship. Who do they worship? Say it louder. The unknown God. Now, Paul wrote it, the unknown God. In other words, you worship, you know not, who? That's the, uh, that's the Samaritans. They don't know who they worship. There's the Gentiles. They don't know who they worship. Now the Jews. Matthew. I mean, it's all over, right? It's all over. You could take it in a dozen places. Matthew 15, verse 9. In 
starts with a V. <laughs> Thank you. In vain, they do worship me. Pause. Back to verse 8. They draw nigh with their mouth. They honor me with their... But what are they missing? Their hearts are far from me. Proverbs 23, 26. My son, give me your heart. No heart, vain worship. The Jews had no heart. They had a lot of something, right? They had a lot of something. Matthew 15, verse 2. Why do your disciples transgress what? The traditions of the elders. Filled up with the traditions of the elders. Matthew 5, verse 20. Unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the Pharisees, now, that's the Jews. And verse after verse, 111, he came into his own, and his own received him what? Not. Verse 12, as many as would receive him, he gave what? Power to be who? The sons of God. There weren't many. There were a few. Luke 18, verse 8, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Answer, not much. But there were a few. This is how they think down there. Just the opposite of how they think up there now back to the old testament same thing in fact parts of matthew 15 are coming out of Hebrew, uh, jeremiah 9 and 10 now who's going to help me with jeremiah 10 now I realize they can't pick it up on the mic cal but i'm going to repeat it after they say it i'm going to take uh, uh jeremiah uh, uh 10 3 and 4 isaiah 2 8 and splice them together who'll start out by reading jeremiah 10 verse 3 and 4 go ahead nice loud voice Whoa, whoa, whoa. The customs of the people are what? They ain't in vain they do worship me. Keep going. Whack, whack, whack. Keep going. Whack, keep going. Mm, good hands there with the axe. Whack. Keep going. Whack. Oh, painter up there with some silver and some gold. That's right. Now in Jeremiah, he does not use the word Isaiah 2 verse 8. Uses. He says their land is full of what? Who's got Isaiah 2 8? Come on, you're supposed to help me. Isaiah 2 8. Their land is full of idols. Now, Jeremiah didn't use that word. Their land is full of idols, commas. Now, read the rest of it. They, same thing. They worship the work of their own. Keep it reading, sister. Boom, whack, boom, whack, boom. Keep going. Now, let's splice them together. The workman spies a tree out there in the wilderness. He takes his axe and with his own hands, he chops the thing down. Boom. Boom. It falls over. What does he do? With his hands, he takes it. He paints it up. He decks it up. He stands it up. And he falls down to worship it. Now let me say it again. With his own hands, he cuts it down. With his own hands, he paints it up. With his own hands, he stands it up. And then he falls down to worship it. Who's he worshiping? Thank you. Now Matthew 15, verse 8. In vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of... Men. Up in heaven they worship God. Down here we worship men. Oh, he's got a PhD. He's got an MDiv. He's on the tenure track at Dartmouth. Oh, he's a white man or a black man or a seven foot man or a four foot man. He's in. Oh, we love to worship who? Men. Oh, I want to be like Beyonce when I grow up. We love to worship men. And God said, until things change down here, you can't come up there. Something's got to ch 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 change. Why? By the way, I quoted a verse this morning, and I said I don't know where it is. I'm about to quote it again, and now I'll tell you where it is. It's always good to know, where do you find that in the Bible? Something has to change. Number one, humans do not like to change. Would you agree? Humans do not like to change. Something has to change change or be transformed romans 12 verse 2 be not conformed to what down here be conformed to up there how by the of your mind something has to change because proverbs 14 verse 12 there is a way that seemeth right to a man, but the end thereof, I'm going to change it a little bit, is death, divorce, disability, and disease. Proverbs 16, 25 says exactly the same thing. Isaiah 55, 8, my ways are not your 
my thoughts are not your... And somebody's got to change how they think, but Amos 3.3 can two walk together unless what? They be agreed. Now, Malachi 3.6, I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. we got to change, because God's not going to. God's going toward life, John 10.10, 10, and we're going toward what? The thief comes but to... And that's the kind of shape we're in tonight here in Uchi Pines. Great, right? The doorstep of death. Isn't that great? <laughs> I need some help. Who am I going to call? Call unto me, Jeremiah 33, 3, and I will answer thee. What do you say, Lord? Eleven twenty eight of Matthew. Come unto me, all ye that are. And I will give you. Now, I'll tell you what the Jesus did for us. Well, no, it's no. He'd be here all night. <laughs> what did he do for us? Well, <laughs> uh, John said all the books in the world, what? Couldn't contain it. No, John, I can write all the books for as long as I live and then can't, can't put it all in there. We read that book when we get to heaven. When, we defend, when do we finish it? Never. Will we study the plan of salvation for endless ages? Now, I'd like to make it practical. Yeah, I know, I'm just, I'm dead, and tri I, I'm, I'm convicted too. I read this kind of thing, and I thought, Phew. I've had five people ask me how I slept last night. I said, lousy. Anybody else sleep lousy last night? It's just me. <laughs> it's infected the whole place. Ashwin asked me too. I'm sorry I can't pronounce, uh, Ashwin, I love him like a, a half son, half brother. I just can't pronounce his last name. You love me anyway, don't you? Change your name to Keith, I can say it, or Smith, or, or even if his name were Nebuchadnezzar or Jehoshaphat, I could say it. But say that last name. I can say it. Sukumara. I got it, Sukumara. Brother Sukumara, I appreciate you. But Brother Sukumara can't give me what I need. I need a, ah, now we're getting there. Dr. Mark, you correct me if what I say is wrong. I need a new, create me a heart transplant. That's our subject tonight, heart transplants. Can God take out the heart of stone, Ezekiel 36, 26, and give me a heart of? Can he? Is it a, is it a painful operation? Come on. Yes. How painful is it? More painful than a heart transplant without anesthesia. Because I was up at 3 o'clock last night, and the Lord, how long does it take to transplant the heart? I mean, not this kind, that kind. Yeah, long time. Long time. Create me a clean heart, O oh Lord, and what? Renew. That, you can't make a new heart. You might transplant an old pig heart or a pig valve. That's what Robin Williams had. He had, no, he had a bovine valve in his heart. And Robin Williams, I heard an interview, he said, I give a quart of milk every day now. <laughs> bovine valve in his heart. You can put a pig valve in somebody's heart, but you can't give them a new heart. Would you agree? Yeah, but I know somebody that can, uh, hey, a new heart. Can you really change your heart? Yeah, so that's not Jesus. That's the first organ transplant. Now, Dr. Mark, any other you health professionals, I'm talking as if it's 1956. So we have these drugs now that suppress immune reactions. You know, you got an tissue, anti uh, tissue antigens. You got different things. The big concern was organ rejection. Anybody know the first organ transplant? What organ it was they transplanted? Heart? No, it wasn't heart. There it is. Oh, I just stuck this on there. When the cell, the cell looks around, and he knows if that heart is not his heart, and then they reject it, right? The antigen. Dr. Mark Shakens, please help me. So the, the cells have an ability to recognize me from you. And if you take a part of Mike Holifield and put it in me, mm -mm, white blood cells on you, right? That's how it works. Organ rejection. So now what the scientists decided to do they tried to find somebody that had tissue with the same antigens. Somebody that would take an organ and not reject it. The first transplant, 54, Joseph Murray. Who did he get the kidney from? That's it. Now, there are, they're fraternal and they're identical. What makes, uh, you, Dr. Mark, don't answer this one now. Let the people. What makes identical twins identical? They don't say they look alike either. Those are identical twins. But it's not that they look alike. I mean, they can, they probably will. What makes identical twins identical? Yeah, yeah. Same 
genes. Gene for gene, absolutely identical. Identical. So if we can find a, and by the way, the transplant was identical twins. You take a man with the same genes, and the chance of that operation succeeding is you know, improved. Back in 1954. Right? So somebody say amen. Okay, there we go. And uh, identical twins. Anybody in here an identical twin? All right, now, before I show you the next picture, let's say I need a kidney. The best person to get it from would be my, I get on twin, mm, but I don't have one. Now, the next, the next best person in 1954, I'm all these drugs today. In 1954, no identical twin? Let's see. Then how about somebody that has some kind of common gene pool sharing something, as many as we can get together? Who would be the person that gave me 23, uh, chromosome, 23 uh, g chromosomes? Parents. So I go to mom. Problem is, I'm 45, need an operation. Mom's 97. Mom can't help me. Doctor says, what about dad? Dad's 110. Who's next? Who can help me next? Brother and sister. Brother and sister? Both, I have two sisters. They're both dead. And a brother won't give me one. Next. No, no, thank you. There's something closer than that. Because the children. Because I get 23 of my chromosomes to my child, right? They're carrying 46, 23 for me, a child. Now, that lady, that red arrow pointing to that lady, you got to learn to think down here like they think up there. That lady, uh, and some of you know the children family with all her children, right? You know, there's, and there's, a, there's the old guy back there, and there's my wife. By the way, did I mention my wife and I just celebrated 38 years of marriage? I didn't mention that. Just before I left, and I left the day after, we set up 38 years of marriage. Oh, we're come. Can you believe that? Now, I, I, uh, Proverbs 18, 22, He that findeth a wife findeth a... I found a good thing, didn't I? Oh, no, I didn't. I, Proverbs 19, verse 14, A prudent wife is from the Lord. The Lord gave me a good wife. 38 years. I can't believe she has tolerated me for 38 years. That woman must have some patience. Isn't that great? That's great. That's good. Yeah, I just, my heart sings when I see her. So, uh, and she's the best cook in the world, too. I know, I know, I know. Yeah. God made us there. Can you tell the lady is standing beside her? Some of you know Danella, right? Yeah, it's Danella Taylor. She was, on her, she was something back then. I don't know. She was, she was doing something there. And then we had Elizabeth. Some of you know Elizabeth. And then Charlene was our music teacher. Asked when you, when you were there. Charlene was there, right? And so there's the group. And there's that lady. Her name was Thora in our lifestyle program from Iceland. Of course, Iceland is green. Greenland is icy. She was from Iceland. And there she was. We had a weight loss program. And so when uh, they come in, our programs are much smaller than the programs here. Just, you know, maybe, you know, two, three, four, five, six, seven, small. And so I get, we get to know people pretty well because it's so small. I came in to do the lecture the first morning, and I knew he was going to be there. It was like, you know, six people. I came in, I sat down, and I thought, we're missing one. Who are we missing? The girl from Iceland. And then she uh, opens the door. We've got like these, I don't think I put a picture of that, did I? I don't, let me see if I did. Yeah, there it is. This is our little parlor where we do the lectures. And there is, you know, we had, this was a weight loss program, I think. And I came in, she wasn't there. Now, by the way, I have learned not to put, I'm learning not to put my foot in my mouth. The best way to do that is let, keep your mouth what? Shut. My wife told me one time, she said, close your mouth. You're getting yourself in trouble. So I don't ask questions. They come. I don't say, you know, where are you from Timbuktu? Are you from Andrews? You're from, you're, are, are you a Christian? Are you a, I don't say anything. I just say, well, I'm glad you're here. My name's Lou. Nice to meet you. I'm so happy you can be part of our family. That's all I say. So the lady, I'm sitting down, getting ready to start. The doors open up, and she comes in dragging this heavy chair from the kitchen table or dining room. So uh, she came in carrying the hard chair, and she uh, sat down in the chair. And I wanted to say, Thor, why did you bring that chair in here? We got these nice recliners. Why did you bring the chair? But I didn't say anything. And so uh, I went home for lunch, 
and asked Darlene, Darlene did a health lecture, did she bring the chair in during the health lecture too? Darlene said, yes. And I said, that's strange, and that's interesting. Two days later, my wife told me, she talked to Thora, kind of woman to woman, and she said the reason she's bringing the chair in is she had one of her kidneys taken out. Ah, oh, a kidney transplant. And it's still painful, and it's easier to sit in a hard chair than a soft chair. Mystery solved. And then a couple days later, I'm sitting there doing some kind of lecture on something, and she says something about speaking Romanian. Do you speak Romanian? And she said, yes. I said, you're from Iceland. She said, but I went to school in Romania. Where did you go to school? Hergalia. Ah, Hergalia. I said, I've been to Hergalia, Dr. Dan, Ludo Prickler. I know some, do you know some people there? She, yeah, yeah, we have some common friends. Safe to ask, are you a Seventh-day Adventist? I said, are you a Seventh-day Adventist? She said, yeah. I said, okay, interesting. Hey, she's a Seventh-day Adventist. And I said, did your mother and father, were they blessed by your time at Hergalia? And she said, well, my mom was thrilled. But when I went, my father stopped talking to me. Guess who she gave the kidney to? My father. So there's Thora with her little things. Now, Thora, of course, that woman that age had a father. I'm a father. I had a daughter that age. So when she said she gave her kidney to her father, it raised a question in my mind. If my daughter needed my kidney, what would my response be? So I wanted to say, what was your response when, but I dare not say it. Now that's me with a child from my first marriage. The daughter that at that time was Thor's age. Yeah, that's me, I know. Yeah. <laughs> hey, when you get old, you get old, right? <laughs> I haven't always had white hair. And the young guy laughing at me, don't worry, you'll look like this in 40 years yourself. <laughs> so there's the baby, and the child had grown up. There's a picture of my daughter today. She's at the uh, University of West Virginia. She's a researcher. I have two grandchildren. I don't have much relationship because that was, you know, that's one of the bridges you burn behind you. You reap the consequences. Remember what, uh, remember what uh, Nathan told David? You'll repay how? Fourfold. Uh, Bathsheba was pregnant. Ammon, Absalom, and Adonijah. Yeah, don't burn your bridges, friends. Do it right by God's grace the first time. And so that's my daughter. And I just wanted, out of curiosity, to ask Thora, came time for them to leave. I'm taking them to the airport. I've got Thor in the back seat, a man in the front seat, and I'm driving along, and she says from the back seat, Mr. Lou, she called me Mr. Lou, Mr. Lou, before you drop me off, I'd like to ask you a personal question. I said, after you ask me one, I think I've got one I want to ask you. <laughs> and so she asked him a Bible question or something, and then when she did, I said, Thora, it's a personal question, may I ask you? She said, yeah, go ahead. I'm driving. I said, you know, you gave the kidney to your father. Now, if she had said, no problem at all, can you understand that? Yeah. And if she had said, I struggled, can you understand that? Yeah. But that's not what she said. It took me a minute to digest what she said. She said, I didn't even have to think about it, not even once. It was automatic, not even one reservation, absolutely, but he wouldn't take it. Huh? Now, you understand, right, why he wouldn't take it. You understand, right? You fathers understand that, don't you? Yeah. And uh, he got worse and worse. And the doctor said, if we don't do something, you're going to die. Had a meeting of the physicians. He asked them two or three questions. Number one, will the surgery be painful? Mm-mm, mm-mm. Will the healing be rapid? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. A few more questions, and the doctors had the right answers, and every answer the doctors gave was wrong. And so after the surgery, he watched his daughter drag that chair around the house, and every time she sat down, she winced. Now, how do you think that made that father feel? 
That's what she told me. She said, she gave me the story. And I asked her, does your father talk to you now? And she said, oh, yes. Dear friends, that's how they think up there. Jesus gave a whole lot more than what? Kidney. That's how they think up there. That little lady sitting in my back seat. I need a brain transplant, don't you? Now, closing two or three questions. Matthew 13, verse 45. The Son of Man is like unto a merchant man selling goodly pearls. Verse 46 who, when he found the one pearl of great price, sold everything. Who's the pearl? There's somebody who said Jesus. Who's the pearl? Anybody else? Oh, we got one Jesus, we got one we are. We got one both. Now I'll read you the statements. Christ object lessons. Oh, Christ is the pearl of great price. Sure he is. Christ is the pearl of great price. And in order to purchase that pearl, one thing thou, Matthew 19, one thing thou lackest. The one thing is our hearts. You've got to give it all. The Lord doesn't deal in 99.9% .9 hearts. He wants it all. Do you have to be perfect? No. But your love for him has to be. Isn't that different? Perfect love comes before perfection of character. Let me say something about failure to those that are failing in here. The one more statement. There it says, we're the, yeah, we're the pearl of great price, right? We are. I was in the Sabbath school in the Waynesboro Seventh-day Adventist Church teaching the Sabbath school. And there was a lady there, Sister Shirley, an older lady. I've known her for 15, 20 years. She raised her hand. She said, stop, brother. It sounds like you don't believe God's ever going to perfect his people. And I said, Ephesians 5, 27, without wrinkle and without spot. Jude 24, to him that is able to keep you from falling and present you how? I said, I believe God's going to. I said, my problem, and I include you, the Uchi Piners and the Wild Woodians and the people at Butler Creek. I include all of us. I haven't met a perfect one yet. I meet people. I work with people that fail and then they fail. And I've not met a Job yet. Have you? I mean, have you? And I told Shirley, I work with people that fall. But my Bible says, Proverbs 6, 24, 16, just man falls seven times, what does he do? He rises back up. What kind of man? A just man falls seven times, he rises back up. 1 John 2, verse 1, if you sin, we have an advocate with the Father. What's his name? Jesus Christ the Righteous. And I said, I deal with people that fail all the time. How about you? The question is, are you going to rise back up? That's it. Somebody calls me, they're in a program. Six months later, they say, you know, I'm, I'm back on crack. What do I say to them? Back up. That's it. That's all Jesus did. Told Peter what? To get back up. Just man falls and gets back up. Gets back up. After a time, you keep getting up and the baby quits falling, right? He begins to walk. That's the first step in be ye transformed into renewing of your mind. The new mind does not come like a transplant instantly. It's developed over time. In beholding 2 Corinthians 3.18, we're changed. So there's a, yeah, I work with people that fail. And I fail. It's good to know that God has helped for failures like me. Isn't that good? Yeah. Luke 18, 9 and 10. He spoke this parable unto certain that trusted themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Let me just take my, my three minutes on this, if you don't mind. The Pharisee walked into the temple and he said, thank God I'm what? Not like them. And somebody maybe even here. The danger, you look at a hooker and you think you're better. Why? Because they're a hooker and you're not. Or you look at somebody, a drug addict, and you, well, I'm better than they are, because why? They're a drug addict, and you're not. They do not think like that where? In heaven. That's not how they think. 
No, I'll tell you how they think in heaven, Matthew 25, 40. What you do, this is how they think up there. What you do unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you just what? Did it to me. That's how they think up there. And by the way, Matthew 9, verse 9, Jesus, Matthew's writing about himself. Matthew 9, verse 9, two words, Jesus said to Matthew, follow me. Verse 10, he rose up and he followed him. Verse 10, what did he have? A party. And the Pharisees came and they said, why does your master eat with what? publicans and sinners that's not how heaven thinks jesus is in the thick of things in there right the hookers and the prostitutes and the bank robbers and the pimps he's in the thick of it what's his purpose because they needed a who a doctor and you guys aren't sick two houses the houses of the sick folk the wellness center and the houses of the self-righteous and you won't invite me in there i'll go here when people need help they need to find it here and our representation of Christ is what heals them. You say, well, they got hypertension. They need to stop eating so much salt, quitting all those junk food Big Macs and all the rest. Dear friends, let me ask you a question. So let's take gene expression. We know today epigenetics. There are certain influences that can stop the expression of cancer genes. True? Yeah, you can uh, active, inactive. Uh, turned on, turned off, expressing, not expressing, these genes. Epigenetic, influences above or outside the gene that can, that can change how the gene expresses itself, can silence the gene. Isn't that true? So let's say, but it takes two things. It takes a decision and an action. I got a gene for prostate cancer. And most everybody here knows what a prostate is, right? Because I'm here in Uchi Pines. Size of a walnut, sits in front of the rectum, underneath the bladder, the urethra goes through the prostate. And when the prostate, you get the exam and it's a little swollen and hard and the urethra can't quite urinate like it should, man doesn't like that. Is that true? So when he comes here, well, maybe Dr. Mark will say, you need to get some lifestyle change going, right? Maybe some exercises, some good diet, get up in the morning, you know, fresh air, all these good things. And that advice is not going anywhere because that kind of advice requires a change in that man. And then an action in that Changes the genes. But friends, how are you going to change without Christ? No, you're not going to. Now the hooker, Matthew 8, uh, John chapter 8, verse 10, verse 11. Woman, where are those thine accusers? Was that woman a prostitute? Yes. Did she need a lifestyle change? Yes. Was the doctor about to give it to her? Yes, where are those thine accusers? Doth no man condemn thee? Her answer, no man, Lord. Verse 11, John chapter 8. Neither, thank you, thank you. Da, da, neither, that was a hooker. That was a whore, we'd say. That's Revelation 17 language, whore, by the way. That's the apostate church. Neither do I. Then he said what? Did she follow the prescription? Why? Because the medicine, a merry heart, doeth good like a, Proverbs 17, 20, 22, like a medicine. Now I'll say that now, the last one. All right, who's the, who's the pearl of great price? We had one Jesus, we had one us, we had one what? Who said both? Well, isn't this good news? Jesus is a gift but only to those who give themselves soul, body. That's a rewriting of Deuteronomy 6, verse 5. Love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. When we thus give ourselves wholly to Christ, to Him, Christ, with all the treasures of heaven, gives Himself to us, and we obtain the pearl of great price. You know what I got in my pocket? Because you can't see it, right? You just have it. I've got the pearl of great price. Now, you come up to me, anybody in here, and you want to buy that pearl, what would I say? Say it. Are those your children, Dr. Mark? Are all these? I mean, yeah, what kind of children there? <laughs> it's a nice, because she gave the right answer. What would I say? 
not for sale. My pearl is not for sale because I am not for sale. We had a guest last week. I said to him, if Bill Gates rolled in here and offered one of our workers $10,000 an hour to answer the phone for one hour a morning, five days a week, he said, that's $50,000. What would she do? She said she'd take the job. No, 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 no. no. Because we found the pearl of great price. Therefore, what we have, and when you have that, that's how they think up there. Why don't we stand together and I'll pray. Now, why don't we stand together sing the first, this is the first line of that hymn. Why don't we have the first line? When peace, you know it, right? When peace like a river. Who come up and uh, lead us? We need a song leader. Got to have a leader. Nobody? Cal? Can you play that? I'll pray. If you'd like to kneel, it'd be fine. <laughs> Our Father in heaven, we're, the price is so low. You gave, well, you gave everything that heaven had to give, and you only ask for our little pitiful hearts. I'm glad you know value, because I don't. It seems like a one-sided deal. It seems like you got the raw end of the deal. But I defer my judgment to yours. And if you think I'm worth that, and I want to acknowledge it as uh, better than I deserve, a manifestation of divine grace, I give you my puny, poor, sinful heart tonight and ask that you'll send down the pearl a great price. That's my prayer. Not just for myself, but for all those that are kneeling here. And may this truly be a wellness center. May those that are here now, those that come here, May they sense their great need and your great ability to provide for it. Give us a mind that would be fit right in there to the church up in heaven. So when then the service opens and maybe Jesus takes the pulpit, we're part of the congregation. He speaks words that reach right to our hearts. This is my prayer. I ask it from my heart in Jesus' name. Amen.